Welcome to Mind Shift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode 24 of my Secular Bible Study series, and I want to say really quick, watch this one all the way through. I think you'll be really surprised with Jeremiah when we get to problematic passages and contradictions. So stay tuned to the end, but let's dive in here. What a book. What a whopper of a book. I am nervous and excited. I'm nervous because I want to make sure I can actually cover this well. The purpose of this series is a high-level overview in 30 to 40 minutes, which is already asking a lot, and now we are doing it on the longest book of the Bible. Many of you probably thought it was Psalms. That's the one with the most chapters. But when it comes to actual word count, we have over 33,000 words in this book of the Bible. So we've been here before. This is not entirely new territory. We're just looking at it from a new angle. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets, along with Isaiah, which we just covered, and Ezekiel and Daniel for the most part. Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah, so we're really going to be dancing in the same arena. And we have seen parts of this story played out before, especially in 2 Kings. So let's set the stage here. We'll move right into point one book overview. This is when the southern kingdom, Judah, and its capital, Jerusalem, are about to be attacked by Babylon. We have many years leading up to this attack. We have the siege itself and then the Babylonian exile. And we get parts of all three of those eras in this book. But who was Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah from a very young age, and this is how the book starts, was called by God to be a prophet. He's also a priest. And we have all the typical prophet issues. No, Lord, not me. I'm not ready. Aren't I too young? And the Lord says, no, it's you. And here's your job. And his job is to be kind of dual ended. He is to warn, but also to bring hope. He is to destroy, but also build up. Spoiler alert, most of this book is about the destroying part. And there's some glimmers of hope that are laced between it all. So again, his job is to warn his people before it's too late. There's going to be some prophecy involved in this book, which we'll get to. There's going to be the feature of a messianic promise. At least that's what the New Testament will point to and the Christians today will point to, as well as a new covenant. So we'll get to all that. We're going to just walk our way through this in sections really quick here. Before we get to those sections, though, I want to make sure we understand the setting completely. Jeremiah is not respected by the elders. These leaders do not like what he is saying. They don't want to hear it. They don't believe him or they're mad at him for bringing the warning or bringing the punishment or the wrath of God with him. And so throughout the book, he is ignored and then he is exiled from the temple or his place of worship. And then he is captured and jailed and taken to Egypt, etc. Not good to be Jeremiah. And I think it's also important to note what is it the people need to be warned of? Why is this wrath of God coming? Well, there's many reasons. Jeremiah points out that they have forgotten the law, that they're not taking care of the least of them, the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, etc. So breaking the laws is a big part, but especially breaking God's favorite law, which is no other gods before him. And yes, we had these people still going to the temple and worshiping, but outside of the temple, they were worshiping other gods, the other gods that came from this Canaanite pantheon. And if you want to learn more about that, make sure Sure that you're watching the Dissecting the Divine series that I'm doing. I should have episode three out here in the very near future. But worshiping these other gods, this is God's biggest deal. You don't do this. So God is preparing his wrath. Now, I think an interesting point here is God's utilization of other nations to bring about this justice to his people, or I should say wrath or punishment, and all the issues that that entails for free will and fairness, etc. But we're going to cover that in point seven. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the structure here. So we have the first 24 chapters. That's the warning. That's everything that they're doing wrong. That's what Jeremiah says God is saying. That's Jeremiah talking back and forth with God. It's all there in the first half of the book. Then we get a few chapters where we see the leadership not liking what Jeremiah is doing and saying. They are not fans. There's a middle section there where we start learning about Babylon and the big threat that's coming. And then we get to chapter 31. I'm going to go ahead and open the Bible at this point because chapter 31 is a pretty important section of Jeremiah. The other thing that I want to point out to you that I think is kind of interesting is that we are this much through the Bible with this much left, even though technically, according to the 66 books, we're only about 33% of the way. But by word count, we're probably about 66% of the way done. So much of this Bible is the Old Testament. 20% happens in the first five books. And if you want to learn more about how this entire Bible is kind of configured in terms of what, well, how often does God talk about this and where is this found, etc., I want to point you to quantifying the Bible. This is an episode I did early on that not many of you have probably seen, and I think that it has some really telling things to say about this book or collection of books. But anyways, chapter 31, the Lord will turn mourning to joy. Let me read this to you. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. 
Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. I want you to remember that for when we get to point seven. Again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. And it goes on. And there's a lot of virginal imagery here. And this is something I plan to talk more about in the Dissecting the Divine series, this weird sexual bridegroom relationship between God and his people. Christians have turned it into this lovely ideal of marriage. No, this is jealousy. This is abusive. This is subjecting her to rape, etc. It is a vivid metaphor of an abusive male essentially owning the property that is his woman. But I'm going to skip down to verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastal lands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. So I read you this part because this book has a lot of, again, this messianic promise of this future leader. And all throughout this book, we hear what this is going to look like, that this one leader will rise up and all the nations, like it's saying here, will know who the real God is. And that simply doesn't happen. Like we've had a few millennia to know this is not the case. Not everyone believes in this God. And we'll talk about some of the broken prophecies here, and there's a few, but the main prophecies that actually happen in this book, it's not nearly as numerous as Isaiah. And if you didn't stick around to point seven for Isaiah to hear all the issues with those prophecies, please go back. So that's part of it, and I am getting off on a small tangent, so bear with me. Let's get back on point. The main part of 31 that I want to get to, and this will be the last thing I read for point one, I'll tell you how the book ends, and then we'll move on to point two, is chapter 31. This is when we get the new covenant. Listen carefully. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, this is extremely important because this is the first place in the entire Bible where we see this law written on our hearts. And I should probably save this for point seven, but I'm just going to do a quick diatribe on it now. Yes, there's some New Testament verses that come back to this. They play off this. But who is the new covenant for? He says it two times here, for Israel and Judah, for his people. We know about his chosen people. This whole idea, we hear it all the time. It's God's objective morality. He's given it to all men. That's why everyone knows the difference between right and wrong etc. Wrong. God started with 613 laws that he gave to a specific people group. Then he said, you guys broke those laws. You broke those covenants. I will make a new covenant for these two kingdoms, for my chosen people. I will give to you the new law this time instead of on stone on your heart. But this is not for us. And if you need more proof that God doesn't care about us, the Gentiles, go watch my Gentiles made them just to hate them video. I think it's a huge part of this book and I wanted to bring it up, but back on point here, let's continue to move on. What do we get in terms of the structure of the rest of Jeremiah? We get a few chapters on the siege itself that happens when King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon comes and takes the city, destroys the temple, and takes the people to exile back in Babylon. And then we get two very poetic parts of Jeremiah, and this is going to be judgment poetry, if there's such a thing. Oh, also before this, we get Jeremiah being captured and imprisoned and taken to Egypt, etc. But here comes the judgment to the other nations. He's using Babylon as a battle axe for everyone in these Canaanite territories that has not recognized him as the one true God. And so we have, starting in chapter 46, judgment on Egypt, 47 is on the Philistines, 48 is on Moab, 49 is on Amnon, and then there's also on Hazor in 49, and then we get to 50. And this is where I wanted to talk about the free will thing here. 50 is the judgment on Babylon. How unfair. Four different times in the original Hebrew in this book, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as my servant from the Lord speaking. He has made it clear to Jeremiah and throughout this book 
that he is going to utilize Babylon as his weapon of judgment to destroy. And then when he's done using them as his henchmen, he will turn around and judge them just the same. And we see that with the Persian defeat of Babylon. Thus, when the Persians take over Babylon, we're told that these great Persians were doing God's work just like Nebuchadnezzar was doing God's work. So all these Gentile nations are just chess pieces to be played with in the great game of God versus chosen people. And this whole book is positioned to us like these people have a choice. Repent before God inflicts this judgment. So what does that look like? If the people had repented, would Babylon just have not wanted to conquer them? What does that look like? Does that look like God changing the hearts and minds of an entire leadership of an entire other nation? Or if they weren't going to attack, that was never on the table until God made it, then the opposite is also true. God's chosen people failed to repent and turn around. And so God has to instill the desire into Babylon to go and attack. And it's a vicious attack. We'll cover that in point seven. Please stick around for this. But the very, very, very last thing that happens, this is chapter 52, is we get Jehoiakim released from prison. Now, this is after they're already in captivity in Babylon. Jehoiakim, who is a king of Judah, gets a spot at the king's table for the rest of his life. And this is how it ends, just very abruptly. But it's supposed to be this indication of hope that God hasn't forgotten these people, that there's still a place for them. And it's funny because this is the second time the writers of the Bible have chosen to utilize this. We see this exact same ending in 2 Kings, I believe. Was it 1 Kings? I think it was 2 Kings. That's book overview. I know it was longer than most book overviews, but it's the longest book of the Bible. We will breeze through 2 through 6 and then spend some time in 7. But 2 through 6 should be interesting. So point 2 is authorship and date. We know that the events happen from 627 BCE to 580. BCE. Very specific. This book has a lot of pinpoints for us. For instance, in one part, there's a contradiction coming. We are told that Jeremiah starts his ministry in the 13th year of King Josiah, I believe. And we know when King Josiah was, we have the lineage of kings, etc. We also have outside documentation. I guess I'm jumping into point three with when Babylon invaded Judah and took the people into captivity. So we do know where and when this is happening in the world. In terms of authorship, it is traditionally given to Jeremiah, thus the name of the book, and it's very probable that if there was in fact a man named Jeremiah, that he did write a good section of this. Now we know that Jeremiah has had help. In chapter 36, we're introduced to, I think it's 36, a scribe or dictator, a helper of Jeremiah named Baruch. Now Baruch plays messenger for a while when Jeremiah can't go into the place of worship. Baruch dictates from Jeremiah, takes it to the people, warns the elders, etc. We also know that Baruch was a compiler, that he was grabbing the best essays and poems and speeches from Jeremiah compiling them. This is kind of a best of book. We see too many changes in narrative and style, as well as actual editorial redactions in the book itself to just believe that Jeremiah himself wrote this, which would really help explain the answered prophecy. Now, there's plenty of things in this book that didn't come true, like all nations recognizing the same God. But one of the things that Jeremiah predicts or prophesies about is that Babylon will take over or a neighbor from the east, but it's very heavily alluded to that it's Babylon, etc. And that's fine. They can have that. There's a couple naturalistic explanations since this is, after all, a secular Bible study series. The first one is that it's not an insane thing to understand that considering what was going on in the economies of the day and the political happenings of the day that this big neighbor that was on a conquering spree might be coming for you in the near future. And you can go ahead and associate that to God's wrath and create a prophet who warns about it to get the people to repent. But that doesn't change that this is something that was a probability. This would have been like during the Cold War if someone was like, hey, if the US doesn't get their act together, I think God is going to send the Soviet Union after us. Like, yeah. And then if it had truly happened like that, that doesn't make that person a true prophet or a seer or someone who had God's foreknowledge, it just made them a predictor and it came true. So that's one option here. And a second option, which people typically don't like or believers is this was written after the fact. I mean, we know that even Jeremiah himself, who died in Egypt, if the entire Egypt exile is to be considered true, was still alive at least long enough to for sure know that Babylon had indeed come and captured Judah and Jerusalem. Baruch would have been part of this and seen this. And again, there's good reason to believe there were other editors and amalgamators and compilers, etc. It makes way more sense that this was all written while they were in exile or shortly after during post-exile to 
put together the story of when we don't listen to God, this is what happens. And look, he gave us fair warning. So I think that's all interesting and important to cover. Let's move right on to point three, though, which is historical background accuracy and context. I think between points one and two, we've covered this. I just want to say there's plenty of conflicting evidence. We have really messed up timelines. We have things that just don't fit, but we do have some things that fit. We have some seals from Babylon mentioning, I think it's Gedalia that are mentioned there that we know are also mentioned in this book. We know that Babylon was on a terror at this time. No one is denying that this kingdom of Babylon existed who attacked this kingdom of Judah and took these people into exile, that the Persians later captured the Babylonians and then eventually let in many different waves as we've covered in other books. Some of these people go back, but not all the people went back and that's the diaspora and that leads us to so many things that happen in the New Testament. So it's important to understand the structures to all of this. But I don't think there's really anything else to say because we've covered this so much in many of the other books of the Bible and what was going on at this time and how we can know and what is missing. So we are going to move right on to an interesting piece for Jeremiah, which is point four, literary analysis. You have mainly three types here. You have oracles, poetry, and narration. A few examples of each of those, like the oracle of the potter's house, Jeremiah's lamentation, and the section on the new covenant. We also see like two unique literary structures being used here. Confessions is one, and we see Jeremiah's confessions, and I'll read you some in point seven, or at least one that kind of shows where his head was at, but it's a very unique look into the life of a prophet, the highs and the lows, the doubts and the certainty, etc. I think it's very interesting, and it's something that is unique to this book above, I think, all others in this, at least until we get to the New Testament and we see like Paul's struggle. The other thing that's really unique is the symbolic action that Jeremiah literally acts out to add oomph to his message. Three examples of this would be literally wearing a heavy yoke, breaking the potter's flask, and the big one is he's so sure that God is going to redeem his people after exile and captivity that he goes and buys the field for future tents. So again, just really kind of putting his money where his mouth is here. So very unique, some new stuff. It's always fun to see 24 books in, some new techniques being utilized, but let's go into point five main themes. The first one, the most obvious one, is divine judgment. Not that this is anything new, probably three-fourths of the books we've covered so far, this has also been the number one theme. This God really likes to punish when he sees fit. This is the warning. This is the first half of the entire book. This is Jeremiah's entire life mission. Watch out. Here comes God. We're also probably supposed to take something in terms of God's faithfulness or the potential of restoration. Again, there is these sprinklings of hope put in here when Jeremiah is feeling good. And even like the very end of the book with Jehoiakim getting a place at the table, etc. There is this idea that God's just giving Israel a timeout, a 70 year timeout that is extremely brutal, but nonetheless, not permanent. Do with that one as you will. And then maybe a last theme that we could focus on is the role of the prophet. We've had some books that explain prophets better than others. I think that the stories about Samuel really give us an idea of prophets and how they were utilized within the monarchy. And there are definitely times when prophets were still more respected or less respected or had higher positions in the kingdom versus lower positions. But we really see, especially since it happens so early and we see the full fruition of Jeremiah's life, the struggle of being called by God to be this instrument for him. And you'll see that as we read some verses here in point seven, so I won't belabor it. Let's move right into point six, reception and influence. Now, when it comes to the Jewish tradition, the thinking is a little different obviously, than the Christian tradition. It is a remembering of what God can do, what he demands of his people, the consequences that can come from not adhering to the law. Christians have a little different view of this book. This is, of course, all the Old Testament nonsense that has to happen. God has to clear the way for his people to have their land and also for the right bloodlines to be able to lead to Jesus, the messianic promise. One thing that is abundantly clear when you don't have the New Testament and you're looking through these altered lenses is that no one in the Old Testament had any concept of Jesus. Yes, there was this vague messianic promise. There would be this great leader or king that would deliver the people or bring them into a new day, a new age, a new reign, but that it would be God's son that was also God in a Trinitarian concept that was nowhere described in the Old Testament until you try to read heavily into it based off some New Testament writings, that would have been ridiculous. Christians so easily map this on 
as clearly Jesus. And there's just no reason to think that that's at all what these people would have been thinking about. So the Messianic promise in Jeremiah is a huge part for the Christians as well as the New Covenant, which kind of is the first step in breaking away from that dirty Old Testament with those weird and crazy 613 laws. So when Jesus comes and we get that Messianic fulfillment and we're reminded of the New Covenant, God's law being on our heart, we can just love our neighbor as ourselves and love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because that's really the summation of it. It's not like Jesus said that he came to fulfill and uphold the entirety of the law and the prophets. We'll just skip over those verses. We'll forget when Jesus said to sell your things so you can buy a sword. We'll forget when he said that he made sure to cross every T and dot every I. We'll just focus on some of his other answers, even though they're contradictory to those things. We can just cherry pick that and get an idea that Jeremiah is really more of a book of consequence about obeying and loving God, but that he will always provide a way back for us. And in this case, we're going to see it through the life of Jeremiah, because one thing Christians do is they pick out any single person in the Old Testament and they say, that was pointing to Jesus. It doesn't matter if it's Abraham, or if it was Moses, or if it was David, or if it was Job, or in this case, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Look at him lament over his people that he loves, that he wants to help save, but they have to listen to the Father. Oh, and don't worry, you will mess up and you will get your time out. You will be punished here on earth, but God will make a way for you to come back. But I'm getting on my tangent again. Of course, there's many more influences from Jeremiah throughout art and literature and storytelling, etc. It is the great story of the warning, your last chance to change your ways. And if you don't, suffer the consequence. But there's still a little bit of hope. Now let's talk about three parts here in point seven, contradictions, some issues with context, and some problematic passages. Let's get the context thing out of the way first. Jeremiah is a book that is cherry picked more than most Old Testament books other than say Psalms and Proverbs. And there's a reason that books like Psalms and Proverbs and Jeremiah get that treatment. It's because even though they say a ton of horrendous things, which they do, they also say a lot of pretty things or lovely things, especially if you take those pretty and lovely things out of context and try to apply them to to yourself. So of course we have Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you to give you hope and a future. That is Jeremiah speaking to who his chosen people, not to us today. I'm pretty sure it's in this book that we also hear God had a plan for us since birth, knit us together in our mother's womb, that kind of a thing. Again, specifically for God's chosen people, not for us. So these verses are hung up in homes and put on welcome mats and special kitchen signs that you can see when you're going about your day. And and the Christian loves them, and they're not for them. And all I would ask is consistency. You say context matters, understand the context of the verses you use for yourself. Here's a couple videos if you want to go see the way we get context wrong. Or if the Old Testament is up for grabs, and we are going to attribute that to us, let's do it with the other parts of these books. And you'll see here in a second exactly why we don't want to talk about too much of this God and his plans for his people, and what that should say as it matches up to us in a few of the upcoming verses. Now let's talk about contradictions. First and foremost, I would have to point out the New Covenant versus how the New Covenant is talked about in the New Testament. These are not the same, but I've already done a little bit of a diatribe there. So let's go on to King Zedekiah. Jeremiah 34, 4 through 5 predicts that his death will be peaceful and that he will be remembered and or lamented by the people. But at the end of the book in chapter 52 verses 10 to 11, we see pretty much the opposite of this. He is captured by Babylon. They kill his children. Then they blind him. Then they kill him. I don't know what the definition of peaceful exactly would be for death, but it's not that. Why isn't anyone talking about that failed prediction? It's so easy to have prophetic books that prove God's truth when you only look at the ones that people made in natural circumstances or after the fact and map it onto the winds. This is confirmation bias at its finest. When did Jeremiah become a prophet? When did he begin his ministry? In the very beginning of the book, we find out that it's sometime in the reign of King Josiah. I think, again, it was the 13th year. But in chapter 25, we're told it's the fourth year of the reign of Jehoiakim, which is like two or three kings after Josiah. You have Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah, and Josiah. Another obvious contradiction that people tried to weasel their way out of is the number of exiles. In Jeremiah 52, 8 through 10, we get a number that is 4,600, but in 2 Kings 24, 14, we get a number of 10,000. Well, Brandon, they were just rounding up. 
from 4,600 to 10,000. Let me give you an example of how much that doesn't make sense. 2,977 people were killed on 9-11. Some people after the known count said 3,000 people died on 9-11. That makes sense. If they had said 10,000 people died on 9-11, which is not that different than rounding up from 4,600, everyone would be like, wait, no, it wasn't that many people. That's not even close. And it tells a very different story. But for some reason, when we look at old things, we say, yeah, that's close close enough. Wrong. We have, again, a mutually exclusive claim. Let's rapid fire some that I won't give you everything and explain them, but if you want to look these up, you can. We have contradictions around Jehoiakim's burial, the identity of the Shepless cities, Jeremiah's life in Egypt, the Ethiopian eunuch, Jeremiah's prophecy of Babylonian rule, the role of the Rechabites, and Jeremiah's confidence in divine protection. Now, that could be attributed to his doubts, but as a prophet who can see the future and is in direct communication with God, it seems a little bit questionable. Those are some, not all, of the contradictions within Jeremiah. Let's move on to our final piece, problematic passages. I'm going to ease you in, and they're going to get slightly worse for the most part. There's going to be some ebb and flow here. Let's go to Jeremiah 20. This is Jeremiah speaking to the Lord. O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side, denounce him, says all my close friends waiting and watching for my fall. So I point this out for one, to kind of back up the claim about him always being on the same page with God, understanding what's going on, etc. But also he goes on here to even curse the fact he was born. This is how much he either hasn't seen the fruition of certain things he has said, and the people are revolting against him. And he's like, why God, have you deceived me? You told me to say this, and it has not happened. So even from the prophet himself, we have this almost admittance of false prophecy. The cursing the birth happens in chapter 15, also also in chapter 15 is one of the first times that he prays for vengeance upon the people that have scoffed at him. But let me read you a couple other verses about that prayer for vengeance. Let's go to 11, 18. But O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. And we're going to jump to one of the bad parts because God immediately answers Jeremiah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine, and none of them shall be left, for I will bring disaster upon the men of Anath, the year of their punishment. No problem. Some people made fun of good old Jeremiah. Maybe some of the men wanted to even kill him. And God said, I'll take care of not just those men, but the younger men and even their kids and their wives and their daughters. I'll only kill some by the sword. The rest I will let starve to death. Oh, what a loving, just God we have. And this isn't the only time that Jeremiah prays for vengeance. Let me give you another one. 15, 15 through 18. O oh Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. And God goes on to answer this with chapter 16, which is famine, sword, and death. Can you guess what happens there? And this happens multiple more times in here. This is disgusting, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. If it gets, it doesn't get better. And I know I'm jumping around, but bear with me. So Jeremiah prays for his enemies to get God's wrath. And then God delivers, remember, with the famine. And then Jeremiah's like, wait, God, why so harsh? Which is ridiculous because then immediately in the next chapter, he prays for it again, and it happens again. Bipolar Jeremiah mixed with psychopathic God, not a good combination. I'd encourage you to read 14, 7 to 22, but here's a small part of it. The Lord said to me, so God to Jeremiah, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. And though they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Now, Hold on to that for one second, and it happens again, and then we're going to talk about it. I really want to make sure you understand how ridiculous this is. Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is to Jeremiah. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons and daughters. Why? For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born into this place and concerning the mothers who bore them and the fathers who fathered them in this land. They shall die of deadly diseases. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. They 
shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and for the beast of the earth. For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, or go to lament or grieve for them, for I have taken away my peace from this people, my steadfast love and mercy, declares the Lord. So two instances of God saying, Don't pray. I won't listen. So in the first one, he says, you know what? Even if you fast, even if you perform the rituals that I told you will allow me to bend an ear to hear you, I have gone deaf. I will not. I have chosen not to forgive. And then here in this one, he goes further and says, Jeremiah, quick tip, insider trading here. Don't get married, man. Don't have kids because what I'm going to do to the people here is going to be horrible. And don't pray to me about it. I'm not going to change my mind. And while you're at it, don't you dare mourn or lament for these people. They had it coming. The arrogance to say at the end that he is a God of steadfast love. And do you remember when he bragged at the beginning of this book about his faithfulness and his endurance? I don't think in the exact same sentence, you can say that you have taken your peace away from them while declaring that you have steadfast love. The definition of steadfast, I think, is kind of like everlasting or continual. You continue to take it away to deny people's prayers, like Jeremiah, a prophet who says, I think this is going too far. Tough, Jeremiah. You prayed for it. Now you're getting it. Don't pray against it. I'm not listening anymore. This is the God Christians love and serve, that they call protector, that they call all loving, all benevolent. It gets worse though. I think I'll do just one more and just know that it goes on. We have God hardening people's hearts. We have God purposely deceiving people. Again, we have God being very unforgiving. We have God inflicting immense amount of justice on women and children who had nothing to do with the initial grievance. But let's end with this bad boy. This is Jeremiah 19, 7 through 9. And in this place, I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem and will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the the hand of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds of the air and to the beast of the earth, and I will make this city a horror, a thing to be hissed at. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of its wounds, and I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and of their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life will afflict them. So, this is God who has chosen people. Some of these other slaughters have been like some of the nations around, but in the siege that God is constructing himself via the people of Babylon, a siege is essentially where you starve out a city. And he's going to allow this to get so desperate before the exile happens, before the total destruction of the temple and the fall of the city, that parents will be forced to eat their children that they just watched starve to death. And why is he doing this? He's already going to make sure that the city falls and that they get captured for their 70 year timeout. So why not have it just be quick? Why not have the city surrender to the Babylonians? After all, he is puppet playing all of this. No, he wants it to be a scene. He used the words horror and terror. He illustrates that he wants people to walk by and see what has happened, to see his power, to see what happens when you cross him. This is like the definition of cruel and unusual punishment. Do you know what kind of trauma it would be to watch your innocent children that had nothing to do with breaking these laws? In fact, God tries to justify it. There's one verse in here I didn't read where he says the parents sent out the children to gather food that then they used to sacrifice to to false gods. I'm sure that four-year-old, that six-year-old, that 10-year-old knew what they were doing when they're just being obedient to their parent, which is something God told them they better do or the parents could kill them for disobedience. Like you're putting these kids in an impossible situation. And because of this, you feel that it's fair to include the women and the children in your wrath. The siege will happen. The children will starve to death. Everyone will be diseased and the parents will have to eat the children. Psychological torture there at the end. Just just a dose of unnecessary suffering. Tell me again, all the suffering in this world is justified and playing a bigger part for God's higher ethics and morals. Nope, this is petty, vengeful payback to make people pay because they didn't worship just 
you and to give a warning to everyone else. This is no different than any mob boss. You don't pay me. You don't give me the respect I deserve. Guess what? I don't just kill you. I kill your whole family and I make a scene of it. That's your God. I do this secular Bible study to help people see the reality of the Bible that is so often hidden from them purposely, because these verses that we just went through, they are fundamentally without excuse. They are in context. They are literal. This is not hyperbole. This is not a metaphor. This is, if you actually believe in this God, his very word, what he wanted. He stopped listening to prayers. He purposely killed men, women, and children in multiple horrific ways for no better purpose than pure vengeance. You can't get out of this. You can't Sunday school sermon your way through it. If you're going to tell me in the comments I'm wrong, tell me how. If you're going to tell me I'm out of context, tell me what the correct context is for these things. You won't because you can't. So if these things are here right in the Bible, guys, I'm not bringing in outside resources here to show you this God is wrong. His words. Either he's not real because this book has made too many contradictory claims, or if he is real, he's horrendous. More than anything else I can imagine, what more evidence do you need? So the next time you as a Christian buy yourself the pretty little Jeremiah 29 11 to hang up in your kitchen from your Christian bookstore, please explain to me why you're not hanging up the rest of these verses. Isn't your God worth worship no matter what? Doesn't might make right? Isn't he all loving and all knowledgeable? Isn't he the arbiter of justice and morality? Didn't he write morals on your heart? Isn't that how you know what's right or wrong? Why not follow him in his morality? Are you against baby killing? Are you against child murder? Are you against purposely starving a people and to force people into cannibalism? If you're not for that, why not? You Christians who rebuke certain wars or certain acts of war, who are calling out war crimes on both sides right now for Israel and Palestine, why? Really? On what basis? Your gods? Where do you get the idea that God doesn't like these kinds of war crimes? Oh, Brandon, you're just an atheist. You don't believe in objective morality. Who are you to even judge? How can you even say anything is wrong? I'll go on record right now saying I don't think kids should purposely be killed or left to starve to death in war to prove a point for that God. And I don't have an objective standard to say that. I have an empathetic standard. I have an understanding of people and of what pain and suffering they can go through and that it's not fair. I can understand that. Can you? I am not on a moral high horse here. I believe most Christians would believe this were wrong if it was in any other context except supposedly the most important one, the Bible, where we get our sense of morals and where we get our understanding of who this God is, how he is, and what he wants. And it's crystal clear. It's way further down than where you are. Christians, you've arrived way past this Bible. Why do you still hold it as truth? Why do you still believe in it? Why do you still call this God good? Why do you call him good father? Do fathers purposely let their children die horrible, painful, extended deaths to prove a point because they didn't get worshipped well enough, because they felt like they were second? It's disgusting and it's inexcusable. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching. I know it's a heavy one. They all are. This book is horrendous all the way through. If you haven't gone and watched point seven of every single other video, just do it. It's in the timestamp. Skip to it. See who this God is from his words alone. That's it. I'll shut up for today. Thanks for watching. Appreciate you being here. I'll see you on Sunday for another video. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconoclist, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Joe, Oliver, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared, Carolina, and Christy, my atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Rocket, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel, or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine patrons. Thanks, and have a great day.